Is this helpful to you guys? Is okay, it interesting yeah. or? Yeah. So I had, a quick, I had a quick question. Sure. So you were talking about the stuff that we do independently. Because I heard somebody talking about cardio. You said something about putting something in your cardioplegia. Okay, so we're given cardioplegia. And uh, we're given the cardioplegia and it's uh, the heart ain't stopping too fast, okay? And we ain't happy about it, all right? So we decide we're gonna take a little syringe full of potassium and we're gonna just pop a little bit into the plege line to get the heart stopped. And so something happens, that patient doesn't do well for some reason, and somebody points the finger. Look at that. How many here have done that? First of all, how many here have done that? So our surgeon asked for it, though. If we yeah. can't do it, so, she wants us to inject systemic. But let's say that's potassium. not what they said to do. They didn't ask are you talking about systemic? Or are you talking about manual into the cardioplegia? Manual, directly into the cardioplegia. Into the cardioplegia. You're talking we about systemic. systemic. Just into our circuit, show us for... Which will do, it's a good thing to do when you're, you're not, you're not cross clamping as well. But it's you know, something, let's say, that wasn't up. asked for. We did it on our, to, uh, uh, we did it independently. Um, and it's not something any of the other perfusionists in the group you work with do. But you did it. And somewhere along the way, somebody said, well, I saw Joe push that potassium in. And that's why this patient didn't come off bypass. They didn't come off bypass for some inexplicable reason. And it's charted. Well, this is this is exactly what Joe is bringing up is a very good point, which we'll probably circle back to it a little bit after we have a little bit more background. But we create our own misery, okay, in the hospital. We create our, our own misery by back hole chatter. Somebody doesn't like Joe. Let's say there's an ICU nurse. There's nobody that doesn't yeah. like Joe. <laughs> but let's do an, an amazingly imaginary situation where there's that one ICU nurse. Who Joe said something arrogant about how ICU nurses can't handle ECMO. Didn't take out. Whatever. Right. Anyway, and uh, she overhears something like that and then decides, you know what, I'm going to tell the patient's family that. The patient died, right? These are all big problems. This is how it starts. Anybody, you know, you would not believe how many lawsuits are started by somebody, say, somebody saying something stupid in earshot of the family. You know, out of frustration, or sometimes inadvertently. The worst thing where that haunts you is you, you ask the key question, did you chart it? When they find out something, now, that's not something that I would think in particular may not, you know, you guys chart everything anytime you give cardioplegia or can you chart that very well. If your practice is to do that, yes, it should be charted. But things that you think are minute, I mean, this is what pisses off cardiac surgeons. They'll go out to cardiac, oh, I heard you did, I heard the, the cross clam came off. Yeah, cross clam comes off one out of every, 20 cases and I put it back on. But someone said to the cardiologist, cross clamp came off. Or, or uh, you, you name it, right? All the little stupidity that goes on in the hospital. And the question is, would you chart something like that? Would you dictate in your op note? No, I wouldn't because it's something that happens in the course of events every single time. You know, the little stupidity that happens. Uh, retrograde cardioplegia cannula came out of the coronary sinus. Am I supposed to dictate in my op note? You, you know where I'm trying to get. I'm saying there are things that are relevant and th things that are not relevant, but don't you dare omit a very relevant thing because it's only going to come bite you. Because as I'll show you, what's happening now is perfusionists are getting, as well deserved, but they're getting their own autonomy now in terms of legal recognition. You're being recognized as a profession more and more by the legal system, right? You guys have had to fight for your rights for so many decades. But with that comes the responsibility and your own uh, medical legal liability. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. But what, what it is is that it is if you, now Joe, remind me, what was the specific thing you asked about that? Sorry. So we're going, we're giving cardioplegia. Right. doesn't stop it fast enough. We decide we're going to just, I decide I'm just going to put a squirt of potassium right into the cardioplegia line. Anybody else ever do that? All right, that's standard of care. If two people raise their hand, it's standard of care. That's the, the point I'm trying to get across. You do not want to get into the situation where you're evaluating a case and you think, boy, that's crazy. But you know, you know other people are doing it. And I try, look, I'm a big believer of antegrade and retrograde. I use both on every single case unless can't get into the coronary sinus, what have you. I do, all right? There are people who only use antegrade. There are people who do the initial induction with antegrade, but use retrograde for the rest. There are people who uh, do but all sorts of things. At the same time? Yep. Yeah. 
Perfume. To increase the perfume, right. So all those things are happening. So if the heart doesn't, after you wean from bypass and the heart isn't contracting, if you did any one of those things, you could say, oh, it's because you didn't use the, way, the method I use. That's not negligence. But there's the danger. Because there are probably those that would say that. <clears throat> and that's what I'm appealing to today. What I'm trying to appeal to is we need good guys out there who understand what kind of evidence you bring to bear and where you can understand your utility and you be a good, fair, impartial person. All right, that's why, that's, that's my biggest utility on the plaintiff's side. You know, my biggest thing that I tell them, you know, plaintiffs, the, the patient's suing. And I said, I'm sorry. It's, I'm sad. I'm sad to see what happened to your patient. But this can happen to anybody, and it doesn't require negligent conduct to do that, and especially with the kind of patients we operate on now. Okay? Did I pardon, answer your question? Yes. Okay. So back to this. This is the areas where you would be a very important. So you don't talk about damages. You don't talk about duty. You're there for the attorney to define the standard of care and causation. A lot of experts don't know that they're there for. They just review a chase. I, I guess I'm somehow supposed to figure out what went wrong, if it did, okay? But that's what you're there for. All right. This, these are the elements of negligence. It's what I just showed you in the prior slide, but it's in the order in which they occur. All right? And those, each of those things, the plaintiff's attorney has to prove by the preponderance of the evidence. If he can prove that you had a duty, that you breached it, and that the breach caused the damage, caused the uh, putative injury, but there really were no damages, there's no case. If no damages occurred, I could have stabbed the patient in the heart. I may be criminally liable, but I did not commit a tort, or I did not commit a negligence tort against the patient in malpractice. I did something else. So what I'm trying to say is, the duty on the, on, on the plaintiff's side is that he's got to prove each of those by preponderance of the evidence. If even one is falls short of preponderance, as determined by a jury, then the case falls and the defense wins. <coughs> okay, I'm going to go more into what this is in a second, so don't worry about it. All right, I showed this last year. So my... Way to recommend, because I think if anybody is thinking about doing this stuff, it's good to be able to keep the, how do you keep this track of this? My little mnemonic is, is, is what? D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper is dead. Okay? So duty, breach, causation, damages. All right? That's the way I remember it, and this way I can think of it in a drop of a hat. Now, there's some controversy, right, Joe? There is. You want to come forward with... Uh, <laughs> and so I, I don't know if I've hit preponderance of the evidence yet, but I think that seals it. <laughs> Who's that? My brother. Really? I'll need to give you the one where he's got his hand on her leg. <laughs> I'll use that one next year. All right. First thing is duty of care. We've touched on it before. Each individual is obligated to be aware of the effect of his actions on others. All persons owe a duty of obligation to act or refrain from acting when the action could endanger others in a reasonably foreseeable area. What is that saying? You should not, you are accountable when you did something wrong, you are accountable for the things that can happen if one can predict that those things might happen. So, if you didn't pota put potassium in the cardioplegia, the patient doesn't come off the table. That's, that's foreseeable. You know you could predict. It has to be envisionable. If you didn't give cardioplegia, you made a mistake, but the patient had no urine output during the case while you're on pump. There something bad with the patient, but it has nothing to do with what you did. It's not foreseeable that might happen, even though there may be a connection. You'll see this come to life in a little bit. It's hard to understand just, uh, you know, but all these things, if you're, 
snowboard, snowmobiling, snowmobiling, is that it? You know, you're going 90 miles an hour, you hit somebody, that's a foreseeable event. Uh, if somebody, if you're going 10 miles an hour and somebody decides to say boo on you hiding behind a tree and gets run over, you're, you're not negligent there. That, that, and that was not foreseeable, that somebody be hiding behind you to scare you. Standard of conduct. Different for professionals, more than ordinary. Ordinary is what the ordinary person is held to. The doctor, the professional, the perfusionist is held to a higher standard. The knowledge and skill of a member of the profession or occupation in good standing in similar communities. Now this is a little bit of a vestige of old. It used to be, and it's not that long ago, where many rural communities did things a little differently than the cities. There was much more of sharing of information in the cities. Now things are easily communicated. People go to national meetings, it's no big deal to travel. So certainly for our specialty, we're held to a national standard, and some might argue international. You know, the, the um, science spreads so rapidly. So this similar communities is falling out of place for, for us. However, if uh, somebody does an ordinary wrong to somebody in an Amish community, you have to judge it by the Amish community standards within the scope of law. And again, how a reasonable person would have acted under similar circumstances, just reiterating the same, I'm going to move on. So some cases that talked about the, the professional level standard, and, and you can see that the, the, the law is trying to grapple with this because they're having trouble with it. 1853, reasonable skill and diligence as thoroughly educated surgeons ordinarily employ. So here there's a bunch of lawyers trying to figure out what doctors do. All right, and how do we hold them to a standard? Not knowing what it is that a doctor really does or how fraught with hazard. And you can imagine back in the 1850s, you know, where half the patients died regardless of what you did, it was a whole different world. And this is what I'm, I'm talking about by common law. These decisions get passed, the next court in the same district would look back and say, okay, this is the standard I gotta use. But realize, like, like, we, like we were before this even started, it doesn't really help you very much unless you know what they signify. And that's where that bell curve comes in handy. Responsible for ordinary care and skill, not the highest degree of skill. Finally, we get to the point where somebody's acknowledging not everybody has got to be a uh, Girardin or, or a DeBakey or a Cooley, right? That it, you don't have to be held to that standard, all right? 1869, responsible for ordinary care and skill as is commonly possessed by men engaged in the same profession. That's pretty good. That's getting closer. And this was the locality rule, which I'm going to skip because it no longer applies to what we do. Let's see. We're going to move on to causation. So this, this cartoon actually exemplifies very well what we have to prove in terms of causation. And here you're going to be very important as an expert. All right. My doctor told me to exercise, it gave me more energy and I got more work done. The more work I did, the more mistakes I made, then I got fired. That's why I'm suing my doctor. <laughs> what this cartoon illustrates is two different types of causation. And for someone to prove that what you did caused something else in a malpractice suit, you've got to satisfy both. The first thing is called factual causation, the second one is called legal causation. Factual causation is this. In truth, the doctor is the cause of this patient's misfortune, this person's misfortune, okay? If the doctor had not told him to exercise, one could argue that none of the rest of the stuff would happen. That's called the but-for argument, okay? I'm expecting a Beavis and Butthead comment out of you. Okay. The, <laughs> the but-for argument. But for this, this would not have happened, okay? But for that advice by the doctor, the patient would not have lost his job. Now, that's factual causation. If Hitler's mother didn't give birth to him, we wouldn't have had the Holocaust. That is factual causation. But of course, all of us would say that doesn't mean we can we may have other things to blame her for, or uh, the doctor for, but that is called but-for causation legally. That's the first part you gotta prove, 
right? Because if you don't have that, you don't have anything that somehow you cause. Now, most of the time, doctor tells a patient, oh, it's safe for you to go exercise. Patient goes exercise and has an MI. There's a direct change. And the difference there is that there's legal causation as well. And I'm going to show you what that is in a moment. Here we talk about the factual cause and the legal cause. The factual, like I just showed you, does not imply legal. Therefore, plaintiff has to do both. So what is, what is, what is legal cause? This is the whole chain of proof the plaintiff has to go through. Start with the standard of care. Did the, did the defendant breach his standard of care? And remember, preponderance of evidence for each of those things. Then you put the patient through the cause and fact test. Would this have happened but for what you did? Now, two guys are out hunting. They see something moving in the bushes. <coughs> they both shoot at what they think is a bear or whatever. One hits the bear in the brain, the other one hits him in the heart. Bear dies. But it's not a bear, it's a human being by mistake. So let's call him Hunter A and Hunter B. If Hunter A didn't shoot that bullet, would, would the person have died? Probably. Let's, let's just, for the sake of argument, say they were lethal hits. One to the brain, one to the heart. <laughs> My heart. <laughs> but <laughs> the, the, uh, let's say they were lethal hits, OK? It, th then you can't pass the but for test, because in that situation, they both were contributory. So you use a different kind of argument. But that's the only exception to the but for test in reality, OK? We use another test for that, where they a significant contribution. And that's what we say. And the way this might come into play is, let's say, you're my perfusionist. You and I both did something bad. And independently, they could have caused the harm. Is each one of us culpable? And the answer is yes, by the argument I just gave you, OK? That we significantly contributed. That if I did something bad and he didn't do anything, and I, caused the, I could have caused the patient's death, and vice versa. I'm going to get to that. I'm glad you asked that question. That's coming up, I promise. The proximate cause is another word for legal cause. And what that means is, was the outcome foreseeable? If you were looking forward, would you have been able to predict that this could happen? I see this guy, Hitler, going around. People are warning all over the place. He's already setting up death camps. You know, one could easily argue uh, that Hitler caused the death of, I'm sorry to use that example. I'm Jewish, so it comes to mind very quickly. But Hitler's mother, you wouldn't say that to. You couldn't foresee that she would have a son that would be a dictator that would kill people. I'm using extreme examples, but it's the same principle. If what you did didn't result in the patient's death, or without it, would it not, the patient not have died? And could you have foreseen that being the cause? Because if not, you have not passed legal causation. That's the difference. It's a very hard concept to grasp, all right? But it's called the foreseeability rule. You have to prove that in order to move on to the next step and, and prove damages. If you don't prove each of those areas by preponderance of the evidence, Again, the plaintiff doesn't have a case. Proximate cause is problematic because we often don't have the information about what caused what, right? It, every patient is very complex. And even the defendants may not know. There is a theory called res ipsa loquitur that's sometimes used in law. So let's say patients undergoing heart surgery and they develop a shoulder injury. Who's possibly at fault there? Anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> Try to exclude your usual knee-jerk reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Nurses, anesthesia, whoever's putting the patient right. But you're looking at a case, 
you know, these cases take a long time, a year later, right? Who remembers who tucked in the arm? Who was supposed to watch out for it? And who is responsible ultimately, whether it's the person who did it or the person who employs them, etc. So what they've done is there's a theory of res ipsa loquitur, meaning the thing that speaks for itself. I leave an instrument in the patient's chest. Whose fault is that? Anesthesia. <laughs> Seriously, though, who's, whose fault? It's the, yours. It's the team. It's the team. It's the team. You know, so it's me because I knew it, but I say the count was correct. Right? And this is where it becomes problematic, right? Because all of a sudden everybody's pointing fingers at each other. Uh, the people were making the count, so pretty much everybody at the table was negligent here, right? I was because I left it in. I'm captain of the ship, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, the, the only people who are not in trouble are you guys for that kind of an incident, right? But pretty much everybody at the table is responsible. The circulator and the scrub nurse, because they're both counting together, right? But what this theory says is it speaks for itself. Somebody did something wrong. What this does is it flips things around from the plaintiff to the defendant. What it does is it says, okay, let's say these are my four people at the table. You guys decide who it is. And so each of them, the, the, the fault is on them. This doctrine pushes the fault on the defendant, and each one has to prove that he didn't do it. Why it couldn't have been him. Uh, it's a dangerous doctrine for defendants because, you know, we, we know something bad happened, you know, but no one can prove and sometimes it's nobody's speaking about it. People are afraid to speak about it or else, truly, no one really knows what happened, even when they've <coughs> gone through a root cause. So it's not a common theory, but there are ways of doing it, even for things that we don't know yeah. what caused. All right. So talking a little bit more about pro proximate cause here to kind of elucidate it to it. Here's a, 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 another case from 2004. Parker was seen at an emergency department for a skin rash. And Parker was complaining of nausea. Patient was given Phenergan by nurse Tyndall. And Parker felt burning in the hand. Ultimately, Parker developed superficial phlebitis, sclerotic vein, and had to undergo a venectomy. Anything here thus far that tells you anything, whether you thought, you think the nurse was at fault or not at fault? Was, was, did the doctor order it or did you give that? Or did you All you have are those facts. No. Nothing else. Okay. The question you have to have in your mind is that does the burning in the hand have anything to do with the rest of this stuff? How many patients you give potassium or something to and they have burning? Right, right, right. Okay, so what is that? What does that mean, right? So that this is the point about proximate cause. Issue, did Tyndall's administration of Phenergan cause the injury to Parker's vein? In any, every, every court decision, they first ask that issue question, which I just asked, right? Did this cause that? Then what the court does is they reveal what the rules they have to stand by and then they apply those rules. These are the rules. Plaintiff bears the burden of proving negligence. We already know that, we've discussed that. Proof of causation requires both factual and legal cause. <coughs> that you already know as well. The but-for test is used for factual causation. You know that too. Proximate cause is that which, in a natural and continuous sequence, unbroken by a new and independent cause, produces injury. <laughs> Hard to grasp. But what it's saying is, did this start the sequence of events that inevitably less led to this, or could things have been otherwise? Here's the application. So we just spoke about the rules, and now they're applying the rules to this case. No evidence showed that it was more probable than not, right, preponderance of the evidence, that the administration of Phenergan resulted in the sclerotic vein. Explanation offered by Parker was consistent with the known facts, but not deducible from them, which is pretty much everybody's gut impression from the case, from just the initial facts alone. 
So the conclusion was Tyndall and MGHP were not liable for the injury to the patient's vein. So it was not foreseeable from the injection that the patient would develop the sclerotic vein. That's not anything that you would even think would happen because everybody burns with Phenergan. Don't worry if you don't completely understand it. It takes a while for that to sink in, okay? But it's a higher level of proof than just showing one thing led to another. Uh, for instance, if something happens and you do something, but somebody else comes along and makes matter worse and becomes a superseding cause, that takes you out of the picture, okay? Can I throw a curveball? Sure, sure. You can. I gotta throw a curveball. It's two o'clock in the morning. We're doing a case, and I've really got to pee. So. I tell you, I've got to go. And you say, no problem, I'll just take a clamp or we get anesthesia. C go over, we stand here, take a clamp. If that level gets below that, 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 that amount, clamp the line, I'm gonna be back in just a few minutes. Something happens, I don't make it back. So a line, some, something dramatic occurs, a line blows. He doesn't turn it down, fills the thing full of air. A big incident occurs, results in a patient, bad patient outcome. What happens? On you. Totally on you. Totally on me. Totally on That's you. That's the last time I do that, damn. Okay. <laughs> it is, it's totally I'm doing that again, okay. Why? Well, you see what, the, well, the question is, is it with any, within anybody's scope of practice in the room once you leave to do that? No. And that's why. That's why. Yes, it's done. But you're leaving yourself open. What about the hospital not employing an N plus one? Okay, now we're talking about policy. Yeah. Okay, now you're talking about policy. So this is where we get into a sticky debate. Yeah. Once you, and we, it's not cut and dry, all right? You'll see one case here they recommended there's always two perfusionists in the room. That's where you How? can burn yourself is because at 2 o'clock in the morning they could require another perfusionist to come in. So right. Two people right, and then your, your allotment, and that's exactly that's right. Hospital. Well, CCF is, can afford something like that, worse comes to worse, right? Because you've got such a big pool of people and you've got such a high volume of cases. But yes, community hospital that employs, it's very hard. But a lot of times on weekends, we only have one person in one case. Right? Or you have to do an emergency case and someone's on ECMO, right? The whole uh, nine yards. But, I mean, you're, you're correct in being incredulous, but it's the reason, it's what happens and why sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. All right, if nothing happens to the patient, I'm sorry? Best to be both. Yeah, best to be both. But seriously, you leave yourself open. If, ever, if, if I, I'm a surgeon, I've just done this horrendous uh, root cono, redo, 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 RV failure, can't come off pump. We've been into it for 12 hours, and I have to go to the bathroom. I go to the bathroom and something opens up. Something opens up and we're on pump and something opens up. All right, and patient exsanguinates, that's me. That's on me. It doesn't matter what bodily, bodily function I had to take care of. Uh, my responsibility would have been, had this go to court, call another surgeon in to take my place while I go. That's, that's the law. That's how it works. Um, and again, when, and when I say... Not in Texas, California is. California it is. Um, you know, that, 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 that's, you know, and there are reasons for that. And you know what, to the to defense of that, there's good parts about it. But what happens when you're requiring more people to work and you're paying less money? Something gives, right? That's what happens when everybody takes another field, right? <laughs> like law. Anyway, but the, the, the um, but yes, that, that, that's the problem. That's why we talk about what are we going to do in this case or in that case when somebody, uh, when you do have to go to the bathroom. It's a problem. It happens, people do it, but if anything, God forbid, happened, it's not within anybody's scope of practice. Um, Can I ask uh, just on that sure. same question? No. And, uh, this is common, I have to say, uh, at least in our practice, if you've had a super long case and you do finally get off pump and you've made it, and you say to the surgeon, I've been back here for 10 hours, I've got, I've got to get out of here for two minutes, I'll be right back. You're off pump. Where do we stand at that point? So that's going to be a matter for the jury to decide. Okay. Things, some things are a matter of law and some things are a matter of facts. 
On pump, it's indisputable. You need a perfusionist, okay? That would be a matter of law. Post pump, when you're off and things are okay, and you've been there, and it's a long case, you have to go to the bathroom, you have to go to the bathroom. And then, of course, what, is it cannulated or decannulated? Right. But all of these, yeah, all of these, the, so, so, these are all factual questions that the experts on both sides offer their opinion about. In this case, you'd have both a perfusionist and a cardiac surgeon on each side. Cardiac surgeon and perfusionist on defense side and cardiac surgeon and perfusionist on the, on the plaintiff side saying woulda, shoulda, coulda, what was below the standard of care, what wasn't. Now the perfusionist, an honest perfusionist, you're there judging a case and this exactly happened. You, think you were off pump, uh, you went to the bathroom, all of a sudden some catastrophe happened, the, patient had to go, the surgeon had to go emergently on bypass and you weren't there yet and the patient had an untoward outcome. Remember, if there's nothing bad with the patient, you didn't, there's no negligent event. It all depends on whether there's damages. If a mishap occurs in the OR and the patient does fine, there's no negligence. It's when you have the series of events. What's that uh, unfortunate series? Isn't there a movie? Any, Lemony Snicket, whatever. When you have an unfortunate series of events that together culminate in damages, that's when you have negligence. The, what, if you did something and you went to the bathroom and, and they couldn't go back on pump and because of that, when, by the time you came back, the surgeon's having to do open heart you know, massage and, and you even going on pump at that point, you don't get back, then, then you have to have the factual evidence. So let's say, let's take that scenario. I'm going to give you the advantage. You are hired by the plaintiff's lawyer to look at the case. And did your colleague, or did he act within the standard of care? Of you, all of you, would you say that that was within the standard of care? That that's pretty common to do. I would. Any anybody would say. I'm sorry. Let's say it was reasonable. Let's say ten minutes. Let's say. Two minutes, then that's not a big deal. Ten minutes, you. Ten minutes is a big deal. Yeah. Okay. So again, you raised a very good point because again, it's a factual determination for the jury, and the jury has no idea, right? They're dependent on you as the expert to say what is reasonable. Throw anything you want. Yeah, but he didn't get fired for that. I, I know who you're talking about. He got. They just were looking for a reason to fire him, and that was the excuse that they used. There were there were a multitude of other issues. Well, that but, but let's say that, that was you know, but yeah, that. yeah. So, that, so now you're talking about a different, so now you're talking about a wrongful termination issue. You're talking about a contractual issue, uh, and God forbid someone was a minority or something. I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of things get thrown in. And that is also a matter for the jury. So they will hear the facts, the law will be explained to them, and it's whether it was reasonable or not for to do it. So you'd have a perfusionist and a cardiac surgeon, again, would both be testifying. Uh, about whether that was appropriate or not. All right? <coughs> and it's not whether 50 would say yes and 50 would say no, because that does not make it negligent. You don't fall below. It's whether 99% would do it one way and 1% would do it another way. That's negligence. Okay. Remember that bell curve I gave you. Uh, just one quick scenario. Um, Cap lab cardiologist does a road replacement, goes through the left ventricle, balloon pump, CPS, goes to the operating room, get on pump, surgeon hooks up the pump sucker line to aortic vent. The pump sucker line is then backwards. Tells you to turn it up, pump air to the patient, the patient dies. But the order, because it started with the cardiologist, and then with the perfusionist putting the line in backwards, and then the surgeon hooking up the line that doesn't have the one-way valve, which is why it's there. So you have like three people at fault. And they would all probably be, I'm going to show you a similar case. Okay, coming up shortly. Well, that didn't go to court. Well, no, no, but I'm saying I have a very similar, these are the kind of situations that, do, so <coughs> the cases that you can read about and see opinions about are not from the trial courts. If something just goes to a trial court, and the trial judge makes a decision and no one brings it to the 
a higher level, an appellate court or Supreme Court, you usually don't see opinions. That's not something you have access to. The opinions are written when it's controversial, when somebody contests something and goes to the appellate court. So, even if it went to trial, you might not see it. These cases that I'm citing to you, the reason I have access to it is because it went to appeal. And things were either overturned or upheld. But the more complicated the scenario, the more likely that there will be people contesting the outcome of a trial. And there would be the way that would normally be held. If the jury decided after hearing all the experts speak that you were culpable, that one was culpable, that one was culpable, the judge, usually the judge determines the percentage of culpability after he hears all the evidence. So he'll say 20% ought to come from you, 30% ought to come from you, and 60% ought to come from him. I have a case just like that, so you'll see that in a moment. I don't know if he'll settle out of court or what. I just, I didn't okay, so that's still, so that's still, that, that's a case that you were asked to review? No, that was my case. Okay, so what will typically happen, okay, so, and, and everybody else was, was named, right? Everybody under the sun. So there's a couple of things that happen that you're going to see in a moment. I like that we're hopping ahead because it means that we're, we're everybody's seeing the point of where, um, what I'm trying to bring up. Um, when you have that scenario, typically that's a dangerous scenario because that's when everybody starts pointing fingers at each other. Okay. Attorney, well, attorneys, attorney, attorneys, attorneys for the defense, if you're ever in that situation, attorneys for the defense will try to work together because united we stand, divided we fall. Not that you're going to mislead, but you want to prevent the finger pointing. You know, I'll never forget, I had a trial that I testified at uh, where this is a case where the ventilator broke down and the patient had to go on ECMO as a result of that, right? That's how bad the situation, because they couldn't trade out the, the vent fast enough. It was a weekend night, nobody around, small hospital. All of a sudden, you can think about how many people were involved in this as defendants. Is it the company? Was this a flaw in the design? Was it a structural flaw? Was it someone's fault that they didn't maintain the machine as they were supposed to? Was this X, Y, Z? Everybody got, got involved in that. And that's a difficult thing, but you know, when I, went, when I was giving my opinion, my lawyer, I was on a defense for the hospital under the captain of the ship doctrine and other doctrines as well. He didn't want me to say it was the uh, the manufacturer's fault, which I felt it was because the, the, everything was maintained correctly and it was all, everything else went according to plan. He says, try to be light on them because we're all trying to be together on this and provide and not slit each other's throats. Well, I did say something about it. <laughs> you know, you, your job is to tell the truth. He, the attorney is not your boss. You are your boss. You're there to tell the truth come hell or high water. But it, if, you, if you want to enter this game, you've got to have the courage to stick to your guns because that's how you'll be a good person, you'll be a good expert witness, the outcome will be correct, and you'll, have, you, you'll look proudly at what you did at yourself because those are a lot of pressures that occur, you know? And you do what, you're, you, do what you feel is right. And we're gonna go on a, a case like that very shortly. You tell me when we need to break for the next time, okay? We're just gonna... So anyway, uh, the damages. So the, right, the attorney sees the Frankenstein coming in and all of a sudden everything's going through his mind. This is very important because it's gonna start to touch on the captain of the ship doctrine and why we use those kind of doctrines. Damage is injury, all right? Remember I told you, you can't have a negligence case without damages because damages is an element of malpractice and you have to prove each element of the suit. Plaintiff must prove that he or she suffered some type of commens compensable injury, something that could be paid for. These are the damages that you can be, this is also something that you may, may have heard about when they're talking about tort reform. You have the general grouping of non-economic versus economic. Usually when they put caps, it's on the non-economic because they're hard to quantify. That's where you get jury verdicts of 20 million. Okay, because they're so uh, engrossed in the story and, and the loss. 
Special damages are, are easier to quantify. So under general damages come pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, loss of earning capacity, things that are hard to predict. Special damages are easy to quantify. Mostly it's past stuff, you know, or current stuff that you missed work, medical bills, etc. And then there's punitive where you're actually not paying the p plaintiff because of something the plaintiff is alleging, but because the defendant did something very bad that they shouldn't have done. You're punishing the plaintiff. You're punishing the defendant. There are also some statutes, which I'm not going to go into, about if, if somebody is a wrongful death, calculating how much money he would have made. It's very interesting to see these because you, you see your life reduced to, to, to numbers, you know. And you know what? Something is very interesting that I found out. So, for instance, if your, both your parents are like Einstein's, you're worth a hell of a lot more than if both your parents are construction people or, or garbage not denoted being bad, but what they do is the parents who are educated and high earners are more likely to have a child that's educated and high learner and, and, and highly compensated. So these are very interesting. These are not within the scope of what we do, but that's what goes into it. They look at all the facts and try to come up with numbers. So just going to summarize, if I can't say too many times, duty of care find the standard of care, see if the defendant breached it. If he breached it, did, the, did it cause the damages that the patient sustained? That's the entire case. Now, we're going to touch upon what you guys were all asking. Okay, who are the defendants? Perfusionist, anesthesiologist, surgeon, hospital, U.S. government. And I put them in a particular order. What kind of order do you see? Money, Money although this is probably reversed nowadays. But, but uh, not so much what you make, but how much coverage you have, how much you can pay to the plaintiff, you or your insurer. It's more about insurance and self-coverage. The idea is, what the plaintiff attorney tries to do, if he sues somebody that's poor, he's going to be limited how much money he can get out of the situation. And remember, he's motivated by the size of the, of the damages, right? Because how is he paid? Contingency. He gets a percentage of the win. So he's going to look for the bigger pockets. So plaintiff's attorneys, within the power that they have and by the rules that are available, will try to get these guys hooked up. Particularly if it's a government case. A case of the VA, where you can hold the government responsible. And I'll show you a couple of cases like that. But that's, that's, that's the, the thinking behind uh, the captain of the ship doctrine and some of the others. So how does blame get shifted to another entity? Two basic ways, crudely. Causation, right? You assign blame. All the defendants are pointing at each other. We've already discussed this. This is what I'm going to discuss now, the damages. There are three doctrines that, that are called into play in assigning blame in the OR. And I'm talking about now that something that would be indisputably the perfusionist's fault. Let's put it that way. Not something that's vague. Um, and we'll go over in a second. So we know why a plaintiff would do this, because we're trying to get the deepest pockets. Now, nowadays, I think you guys have almost as much malpractice coverage as we do. What is a typical policy for you guys? It's actually, it's ridiculous. More than it for us here in Texas than you. It's $1 million, $3 million. Uh, occurrence, and then some hospitals require that we carry a five million dollar umbrella policy. Wow, it's for us, for, for us, most for the most part, it's one in three, but in certain markets, it's it's higher. It but so you now you're pretty much comparable to what to what we the coverage we need. So now it's not as important. But who's got limitless money? It's the hospital. Okay, and that's that's where they try to find. And so, and remember, these are not. The lawyer may be motivated by self-interest, but there is a poor patient involved. If the patient was injured, terribly malformed, <coughs> life has been ruined, they're entitled to something. And if you sue somebody who doesn't have the money to, to suitably compensate you, you know, you're, you, the society hasn't done right by them. So we, because we're on the profession side, we tend to see it in one direction only. But what we're trying to do is what's fair. 
what's fair? How do we distribute things so that it's fair? So it's almost socialistic in some respects. It's saying, take the money from those who can afford the most to give. And that's what part of this is about, okay? So we call that vicarious liability, okay? Vicarious liability is when you haven't done anything bad, but you're being held accountable for somebody else's misdeeds. So here I'm saying H is hospital, S is surgeon, P is perfusionist. I'm not saying anything bad about perfusionists, but it's because of this audience. I want to make it realistic and so we can all understand it. So one party, hospital or surgeon, may under certain circumstances be held liable for the actions of another, even though A, um, not A, but A, either, even though H or S is without personal fault. In order to do that, two conditions are required. There must be some kind of relationship between the hospital and the perfusionist or the surgeon and the perfusionist. Some kind of, uh, whether it's economic or supervisory, that goes without saying. That's not much of a, a, a demanding criterion. The uh, perfusionist must have been acting within the scope of the relationship when he committed the tort or injury. All that means is you didn't go and assault a nurse in the hallway. <laughs> Right? You did something in the OR that was bad that ended up hurting this particular patient who you owed a duty to. So really, it's not very helpful. Most, most of us can think about, well, basically every patient. The rationale is to ensure a solvent defendant for the sake of the plaintiff, okay, who has been harmed. Because theoretically, right, if you didn't do anything wrong, nobody is going to pay. We know that's not how it works in reality, but that's, that's the thought behind this. Affordability of loss. The loss should be borne by the party that can afford the loss. The employer can accommodate the loss by increasing prices or lowering dividends. So that really is the philosophy that you basically, if you, and let's talk about employment because it works the same way in employment. You have a corporation. If the corporation, uh, let's talk about a, a uh, um, like your company, okay? So let's say there's a mishap with a, a pump where the company has to pay out. I'm picking on you because you're the only uh, heart lung machine person here. But, and, you, and your company has to pay out. The, the philosophy is let's make that company culpable because this company, if it loses money, will either decrease their dividend to their shareholders this year or or do something different to their bottom line, they can accommodate it much better. I mean, you know that sounds absurd. It's social, socialism, that's what it is. But that's, what, that's, that's the philosophy behind this. Well, as opposed to, as put now, go ahead. I have a, a good example, I'm sure you're going to agree. We have a product that's heat approval, and it's a product that has to be approved Non-tuberculum mycobacteria. And that's a prevalent bacterium. It's in the soil. It's in your shower head if you just try it on there. It's but on your yet, CPAP. They're saying that some of these patients, possibility of them being able to contract it from the elbow. But it's never been proven per se that that's where it comes from. But yet some of the hospitals, not my area, but some of the hospitals in other areas are actually suing the company. And they're saying that So that's a very good contemporary example that's going to be very challenging, okay? Because on the one hand, the government would talk about, the, the, you know, a lot of the manufacturing companies are strict liability companies, you know, that, that they're, they're accountable no matter what. Because, again, they have deeper pockets than even the hospitals do in many situations. The hospitals can sue you only if the hospital can prove that it's lost money as a result of this. Now, are they claiming that the infections cause the patients to consume expenditures. What is the hospital's basis for suing you guys? I don't know. It's okay. Not my area, okay. But I think it's because they, from what I understand, because it's a rep there, it, they're saying that that product, the hospital's saying the product caused the patient this pneumonia, uh, whatever, or this, sepsis. Or is, yeah, of this bacterium, where you can get the bacterium in water or something. Right. Right. And that's, and that's going to be huge. Right now, is it at the point that it's a, a uh, class action suit or not yet? I don't know. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, so then all, all the attorneys are out doing the advertisements. They love the class action stuff, especially when it's the manufacturers. Because they're the easiest to take a hit. Why are they the easiest to take a hit? Deep pockets, but also no one feels particularly supportive of them in society, right? Nobody's out there in your corner, all right? Uh, right? Pharmaceutical, manufacturers. Uh, if you listen to certain politicians, they're the reasons why expenses are so high, right? You know, all that, all that stuff. 20 left for this one? Okay. And is this my second or third one? You're combined. <laughs> I'm losing it. Anyway, anyway. So uh, what would happen in that case is all those facts would come to bear, and it, they would probably, uh, what, the, what the attorneys are going to try to do is come together and do a class action so they can litigate it as one. The government will want them to do that as well because it'll decrease the cost of all the uh, things. And it's going to be a huge thing. It's going to be a, hundreds of expert witnesses on both sides. Uh, saying why it can't or can't. And this is what they go through, though. This is what they go It's going to be ultimately a matter of causation. Okay. And uh, is the causation that was created by the actual operator of the device that didn't clean the equipment? That would be a mitigating factor. Well, that, that, that may shift the blame. Now, it's hard, to do, it's, hard to, it's hard to impute that when you have multiple hundreds of hospitals that have the same... Uh, cause, but what what is going to do? It's going to be much of this stuff is not clear cut, and the courts have a lot of leeway in judgment of fairness. If they think something is going to be the fair way to assign blame, if all the criteria are met for proving the case, they're going to do it in the way. The doctrines that I'm going to talk to you about now are what allows them to do that. And I'll show you why it does. Okay. Um, also, the last part we're there is why do they give it to the bo to the boss? Because the boss, if it's going to mean a difference to the bottom line of the boss, he's going to ensure that his employees toe the line and don't create these mistakes. So, if the boss is being held accountable for his employees' mistakes or negligence, he's going to ensure stricter controls. Okay. Theoretically, that's the rationale for giving vicarious liability to someone who supervises. Can, can I ask a question? If, of course. If in a lawsuit, like you said, everybody in the room <coughs> is brought into the lawsuit and as perfusionists decide that there was no negligence on your part, it was, uh, let's say, the surgeon. But I've incurred some damage on my reputation. On the, are there cases where the perfusionist would sue the surgeon? Uh, Probably not. It would be hard to do if it was if the surgeon didn't deliberately do something. And those there, they've been cases. All right, there's cases out there where the the surgeon has ruined the reputation of the perfusionist, and the perfusionist sued the surgeon. But that was deliberate uh, libel and slander, right? So so that's a different story. That I don't think you're going to have a cause of action. But uh, and as long as everybody's acting in good faith. What it is is the surgeon didn't make you be the one who they got charged. Now, if the surgeon's out there and saying it was your fault and it wasn't, then you may have. Then you may have a cause of action. The problem with all that is that everybody knows an individual, especially ourselves, we don't have that kind of money. So well, I, I, got, I got to tell you, that's something that we see as physicians because you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Has anybody here been involved in a claim, named in a claim? Not necessarily that it was found, that found guilty or found liable, but named in a, in a, in a suit related to perfusion. It was actually uh, legal malpractice suit I was involved in. Where you were suing? Or? No, no, the family was suing the lawyer that said they didn't have a case. I, Alan, you were, you were you, so, and you, you, so there was no case, so you didn't have any claim against you. Gotcha. How'd you find out about that? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, legal malpractice is another arm of malpractice. And then lawyers, you know, they, they're, they're a little bit lucky because their buddies help them out. <laughs> yes? I was finding a lawsuit. In suit. Oh, the whole total lawsuit was $10 million. Well, what it was is it was a product that our company had. It was a company that we'd merged with, another company had the product that they were repping for another manufacturer. And so, 
lot of people had used the product, but there had been some problems with it. But they decided to leave it out there, this other company, just because you know, some people wanted to use it. So the hospital called me up to see the perfusionist in charge of that, showed him the product, asked if I needed to in service the staff. No, no, we've already used it. I'm out of town on vacation, I get a call from the hospital saying there was a patient death this morning and we need you to get an engineer in here as soon as possible. So we sent one in, I was on vacation, sent one in, and it ended up going into a lawsuit because it was a small child that expired, but it was due to a the perfusionist not performing something that they should have done in their pre-checklist, unfortunately for them. But anyhow, I mean, we had this excellent lawyer, and uh, for $58 million, we got it down to a million dollars, and it was the manufacturer of that product that paid. Even though the court found that, the, that it was the perfusionist's responsibility? I don't know how it ruled. Got gotcha. you. I just know I Probably just, settled. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's the other thing that happens is there's a lot of the parties split off and settle, and that puts you in a very precarious situation. Yeah, All the had settled out of court. Gotcha, gotcha. So that pulled them out. And that's frequently what happens. The, the lawyer will try to get deals from everybody, and then all of a sudden you're not in the in the room. So now you're, let's say, uh, plaintiff sues the perfusionist, the surgeon, the hospital, and the nurses at the table. Nurses at the table, long history of, of, uh, of uh, the, the hospital's responsible for them. That, that's one thing that's clear. So the hospital decides to settle, leaves the surgeon, the perfusionist. All of a sudden now, the surgeon and the perfusionist are going to want to say it's the hospital because now the hospital's off scot-free, right, and assigning blame that way. And, and the politics are, are amazing because the hospital is scot-free, although the reputation can be armed. Fifteen left? Is that what you're telling me? Just tell me to stop when, when it is because no, I... I'm, I'm trying to help you. So that oh, you're not helping me. Ah, don't worry about it. So this is just another thing about the, the deep pockets we've gotten this point across. Okay. So now to, to the crux of the question. Are perfusionists the agents of either the hospital or the surgeon, or are they independent? And this is particularly with respect to being sued. And if you're an agent, are you independently responsible, or are both you and the hospital responsible if, you're, if, if, you're, if you have some degree of control? One of the questions is tied into what Joe is talking about. And I saw it looked like to me like about most of you are employed these days. Maybe two-thirds are employed and a third in this room are in some kind of uh, contractual capacity. Uh, this is very important, but it's not the be-all and end-all. Okay, if you're an employee of the hospital, it's cut and dry. You are, uh, the hospital is vicariously liable for a mishap that you do, okay? If you are independent contractor, a lot of it depends on the apparent degree of control the hospital has over how you practice, okay? So does the hospital exert control over your services? And how do lawyers pr prove control? They look at the contract at the hospital, if you have a contract, all right? And they'll see about what responsibilities go to you and what responsibilities are go to the hospitals, whether you answer their nursing or whether you're independent. Um, whether they have a close supervising capacity or you're pretty much left free to run things the way you want as a perfusionist. Is there a parent agency? Does it appear to the patient as if the perfusionist is an agent of the hospital? I would say yes. I don't think the perfusionist. First of all, how many of you meet the patient before the surgery? A handful, okay? That's rare, right? It's rare. So the patient doesn't even know. And they talk about a parent agency. So for all intents and purposes, if you're invisible, you're part of the hospital, all right? Even nowadays, uh, physicians are now, many of them are employed, so they're agents of the hospital now. You know, they, they, their independence is, is no longer, you know, a given. The consequences of, if you're an agent of the hospital, the hospital is considered vicariously liable for the torts of its agents. But only things like negligence. If you do something intentional, Hospitals, on, even on hospital grounds. If you go and grope a female nurse, or male nurse, sorry. <laughs> but if you grope, you know, uh, that the hospital is not liable for. However, the hospital knew of previous 
situations where you had done that and you had not been disciplined or fired, then that brings in the employer. <coughs> this doctrine is called respondeat superior. Let the superior make the answer. Very simple. The scope of the liability, the tort must be committed within the scope of practice and it must be this negligence type situation, not the intentional torts. And we talked about this degree of control. And one of the ways that the law has spoken about this is this master-servant relationship. Don't get uh, <laughs> insulted. It's, it's, the, it's the lingo of the law. An employer is considered the master and the employee the servant. And the question is, are you guys servants of the hospital or not? One of it is going to depend, obviously, on whether you're an employee. But if you're independent, Joe, you know enough about this. Do you consider yourself, if you did something bad in the OR that really was clearly your fault, do you, and, 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 and what's happening here is the lawyers are trying to figure out a way to impute the blame on the hospital because they don't want to just stick to Joe's insurance they want to be able to get the deeper pool of the hospital but what do you think if somebody looked at the scope of your practice what would they say would they say that you are controlled by the hospital or you're more or less independent i think i think it's gray i think it's very gray and i think because of that um, that's why we are seeing uh, several of the hospitals and i think it's going to be all of them uh, in short order requiring this very expensive uh, umbrella policy because they recognize that the attorneys are going to look for those with the deeper pockets. And if they're limited here in Texas with how much they can be sued for damages and you are equal to that or greater than that, you will be the more likely target. And that is, you know, a, a, like I said, it's, it's, it's an enormous problem for us because this umbrella policy, the insurance companies recognize, makes you a target, and the cost of it is uh, at times prohibitive. So that has a lot. Required. So it has a lot of implications for you as an independent perfusionist, right. your competitiveness in the market. Because if you don't offer that, right. And what happens is our, some of our competitors um, that are much larger, of course, are, are privately uh, they're self-insured. They have a bond, and they're able to utilize that bond to meet this bar, and so I'm in a constant battle with how do I afford this, pay my employees, and what do I charge the hospital to not be out of the market where they can walk in and be much more affordable. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's constant, nonstop economic juggling. And I think, unfortunately, you're going to see that more and more until you become employed by the hospital. That ain't gonna happen. Yeah, that's. I, I, I'm almost towards my retirement. I'm going. I'm going out fighting. <laughs> They're gonna have to pry those clamps out of my. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna skip this slide. It's just a summary slide of what I've just been telling you about the relationships. But what it, the point is, if you're an independent contractor, but it appears that you are controlled by the hospital, and right, we already spoke about the ways they look for that. Then uh, they can still get back at the hospital you know, and, and sue the hospital as well. And it's almost routine. I don't know of any case where a perfusionist is sued on their own. Do you? Any of you know? I, I have not seen one. Um, let's skip over that. That's just more of the, here we're going to go to the captain of the ship. All right, I'm going to start on this and then we're going to take a break. McConnell v. Williams. This was a, a, a procedure uh, where, let me see, was it the... I think we're going to find out in a second. Where they declare the captain of a ship doctrine. And basically what it says is that the surgeon is in charge of anything that happens in the room. Okay? And this doctrine is from decades and decades ago. But that's where it came from. And you'll, you'll hear that term. The problem is surgeons have been their own worst enemy. Is right? I like to hear that I'm the captain of the ship. They've been their own worst enemy. Surgeons have testified in court. Plaintiff's lawyers are very smart. A not too savvy surgeon gets up there and he's the defendant. 
Sir, would you consider yourself the captain of the ship in the operating room? And you know you guys, maybe no handful of surgeons that might have a tendency to answer yes to that. And then they got him. And they got him, in their own words. What they're saying is that they're responsible, without even knowing that that's what they're saying. So I mean, surgeons have been their own worst enemies. This is a specialized variant of the borrowed servant doctrine, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and the other concept to know about is the non-delegable duty. So when you do something bad, and let's say the surgeon or the hospital is sued as well, you can either have a delegable duty or a non-delegable duty. It's full of fancy words. That's half the law school, just to figure out how to use them. All that means is, can the hospital delegate its duty to the patient to you? So if you're an employee of the hospital, and the court says you have a non-delegable duty to the hospital, the perfusionist is off scot-free. He's not liable. The hospital is the one who stuck their neck out and should take responsibility. If they had a delegable duty, the hospital could assign some of that responsibility to you, then you can share in the culpability for the case. So the hospital, it's not up to the hospital. It's up to law to determine whether the relationship is such. So what's being done here is these are doctrines used by the plaintiff that have been set in precedence or have shown that the hospital or the surgeon, and some of these have changed, some of these are, are not much in use anymore. But this is the basis of them saying, we're going after the surgeon. Okay, and this was not uncommon back in the 90s. For, and I'm talking now about perfusionist action, perfusionist problems. Um, so, uh, you know, in the, we talk about the borrowed servant doctrine, which is just another one. So let's say you are employed by the hospital. And I hate to make you guys feel bad, but you did something bad again, okay? You did something bad and you're employed by the hospital. And you did it during a cardiac surgery case, right? <laughs> if you don't have responsibility for it, who do you think has responsibility? The surgeon or the hospital? We're talking about damages. And we work for the hospital? You work for the, the hospital. hospital. So lawyers will try to include the surgeon under the borrowed servant doctrine. Borrowed, and this is all well-established precedents in other, in other areas, employers. So if a contractor lends one of his workers to a subcontractor and the, and the worker that he lent out did something bad during the scope of his responsibilities while he was working with the subcontractor, with the specialized guy. So the question is, who's, who's going to be ultimately responsible? Is it the employer or the person whose auspices they were under when the bad thing occurred? And so the borrowed servant doctrine means that the surgeon has borrowed you from the hospital during the case, and the surgeon is culpable for what you did. But what if they're also an employee of the hospital? They'll Those go, after, they'll go they go, it. that's a reason for going after both. Respondiat superior for the hospital, borrowed servant for the surgeon. Yes? You know, this comes up a lot, I think, for perfusionists. Um, when you're in a situation where, and our answer is, well, we'll just chart it, we'll be okay. But if the surgeon tells you to do something that you don't think is a very good idea for that patient, and you end up doing it, then you charge it. Does that protect us in any way? Yes. Okay. Yes. So your your so Dr. Lynch, I don't 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 lose your thought. So his, his your lunch talk is actually going to be on um, this business, actually developing that kind of a business. I don't want to cut you short here. We've got five quick minutes to wrap this up. I want to sort of stay on time today. Um, and of course, you're available to talk to anybody later as well. So please forgive me, but I want to make sure that we're clear on that. Okay. So what is what was that? How did that pertain to that question? You want me not to answer the question? No, no, you can no we can, Joe. We can stop. We can stop anywhere because I can. I can stop. This is not. This is the kind of talk that you could carry on for years and years. Okay. So, so I'm just trying to get as much information as okay, I can so you across. Can answer his question within four minutes, please. Sure. And then we'll we'll call call it a day. <laughs> now you made me forget the question. What well, was it? Or even if you don't charge it. But the point is... 
chart everything. When in doubt, chart it. Okay, there is nothing that's going to hurt you more than the absence of charting in a situation where it's he said, she said. Okay? Uh, whether Now, unfortunately, your perfusion sheets don't leave much room for charting, so whichever. Are you guys electronic yet? Yeah, that's okay. And, auto, and it automatically and automatically gets tra- oh you guys you're lucky. Uh, so it's like a bunch of different scenarios there, you know, for certain reasons. So I'm asking like how is that gonna change our You you're you're all wedded at the hip, okay? That's the problem. Okay. Uh, as you know, most occurrences are a combination of problems on both ends. Often a failure of recognition. The safety the safety mechanisms fall through. Uh, there's a breakdown in communication between the surgeon and the perfusionist and something is done that shouldn't have been done. Everybody doing things appropriately in the world that they envision had it been as they envisioned it. So your documentation protects you, okay? It protects you, it protects you, it protects you. Whatever you do, don't falsify. And don't, I, if there's something, it, of the stuff, I'm gonna get to you in just one sec, if, of the stuff that I'm talking to you about today, because that's why the talks were kind of uh, enveloped. It's, it's meant not just to give you an idea of the law, not just to make you an expert witness, but also how to protect yourself. Okay, seeing what can be brought up and how things are attributed, you want to be able. Yes, you want to be able to stand up and say, I did this, this is my fault, and I, I take responsibility. But when it's not yours, you don't want to be dragged down in the situation. And you know, what? Again, it's going to be 99% of the time it's not a problem, right? Because suits are very, are relatively rare. But when they do occur, that's when it becomes. I ha- I've reviewed perfusion sheets. I've reviewed anesthesia records. I'll give you a recent case I reviewed where it was just horrible. I said to them, listen, guys, you guys better settle because this looks horrific no matter what it is. Circ arrest case. Surgeon insists they were at 20 degrees. And this was with anti-grade cerebral perfusion. Surgeon, surgeon is this, which is the better way to do it, by the way, and if you don't, it's, it's, uh, it's below standard of care. Anyway. Proven, 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 <laughs> proven wrong. Anyway. So, um, sorry, where was I? I shouldn't interrupt myself. The surgeon thought it was 20 degrees. Thir- thir- surgeon thought it was 20 degrees, uh, stopped the pump, went to anti-grade cerebral perfusion. Surgeon is saying it's 20 degrees. This is in retrospect. Anesthesia record has some cooling down. There's a t- last temperature anesthesia has recorded is 33 degrees. And then there's a straight line all across the whole uh, circle rest period. It says 20.0. It's like the nurse who records 30 cc's per hour urine output on the dot every hour, right? That, that raises eyebrows. Perfusion shows 38, 37, 36, 35, 33. 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, and then rewarming. The cooling period was 25 minutes. If you do, right, if you do cooling safely, <laughs> it's not that easy to get to from, from uh, 37 to uh, 20 degrees that quickly, okay? But now, you know, all of a sudden, you've got this discrepancy. Of some, I think what the anesthesia did, and not even thinking about it, because you probably forgot to chart it, and you said, okay, 20 degrees, because that's where we were supposed to go, but has that line, and the surgeon's saying 20 degrees, but I believe the perfusionist. He's the only one recording, you know, and plus it makes sense, right, for for that rapidity of time, that they didn't get that cool. Now, does the perfusionist have any blame here? Of course, right? Over your dead body, are you going on circle rest at 32? Maybe 28 with anti-grade cerebral view, but not, you know, you, and, that, and so that's where your responsibility is. But that's also why, you know, informed surgeon that this, you hate to do that, you hate to do that nursing thing, but in the current climate, it's dangerous. You should see, yeah. That's even, that's fantastic. The electri- EMR, and I'm going to finish with this last point and then we're done. EMR has been a bane and a boom. For the, for, it's been terrible because if you look at electronic medical, I mean, I'm reviewing all electronic medical records now, and it's horrible. All the stuff, the, the, the wrong things that get transmitted to make them look like cavalier uh, um, caretakers, 
and yet you have the accurate stuff. And, you, and as you know, sometimes if the automatic ones, you've got to troubleshoot, but some of them don't get recorded like the swan. If, if somebody's uh, giving volume or whatever, all of a sudden you'll have this aberrant temperature. So think about if you really want it to be safe, what you've got to be doing now. Now you've got to document every little thing. Right, uh, the anesthesiologist. Like, oh, I injected cold saline. That's why this temperature. It, it's going to drive everybody nuts. How is that with anesthesia charting when perfusion's on pump, kind of double charting when you get into that concept of yeah, and that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Right. Right. None. Right. So if the anesthesiologist wrote C perfusion record and didn't write the twenty, you would have been okay. Yeah, because most of the time they're not there anyway. Right. They're right. 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 Or, or they're reading a different temperature, right? Someone's reading uh, pharyngeal, another person's recording venous it's from like the... the it's like the clock. There's four clocks in the room. Yeah. They're all doing the one on the top of the anesthesia different. machine. The one, the, the one on the wall and the one on your wrist. Which, watch are you, which clock are you using? Are they all synchronized? It's crazy. Okay, right. so we're going to... We're, we're, we've got...